want to have you open up to Isaiah 58. It's not a text that I have listed, but uh, it's where we're going to start today. Isaiah is just past the middle of the Bible. If you were to crack it open. Uh, it's a text we used last week to talk about fasting. Uh, and, and this text also is important because it carries uh, the importance of Sabbath. Uh, so in Isaiah 58, after we hear God speaking through Isaiah to warn against what fasting should look like, then he carries right into the Sabbath day. This is verse 13. It says, Keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interest on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath. And speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. And honor the Sabbath and everything you do on that day. And don't follow your own desires or talk idly. And then the Lord will be your delight. And I will give you great honor. And I will satisfy you with the inheritance that I have promised to your ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord your God, have spoken. Now, as we get started uh, into this discussion, there's a few things you need to understand um, and know before we talk about Sabbath. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I do not practice the Sabbath. Uh, it's a discipline that I think uh, we should uphold and that Christians today should uh, practice and follow, but it is one that I find it uh, very difficult to, to create the space and the time in my calendar to do that. Now, that is not to uh, excuse me from it, um, but it's a confession on uh, my part to, to say to you that just because I am speaking on this, I want you to understand that I do not uphold this practice well in my life. Uh, and it's something that I'm working on and that I'm trying to uh, get centered on in my own spirituality and my own faith. Um, second part is, uh, as with any week, these, are, uh, these teachings are so small uh, in, in what I'm sharing and what I'm talking. And so do not take them as uh, the end all on what this topic means. Uh, with fasting... Uh, with, with each week that I speak, uh, these are uh, important things in Scripture and important things of faith, uh, and it is your responsibility to take that and then to, to understand and to study that further and figure out where the Spirit is speaking through you, through Scripture, and through the saints, and through the traditions and the history of the church. With that being said, uh, the Sabbath is, is one of the most misunderstood disciplines that I think we have within the Christian church. Uh, if you were to talk about what the Sabbath is, uh, to most people, they would say that Sunday is the Sabbath. And Sunday uh, is indeed not the Sabbath. Uh, Saturday is the Sabbath. Before we uh, had our calendar, the Roman calendar was put into place, uh, the Jewish calendar was understood in regards to the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the day that they held. The day after the Sabbath, the Sabbath was the end of the week, the day after the Sabbath, and the Jewish mindset was the first day of the week. And the day of the week was referred to in Jewish terms as the first day towards the Sabbath. The second day would have been called the second day towards the Sabbath. Not very original, but you get the point. The idea in the Jewish idea, the Jewish faith, the Jewish theology, is that the days of the week are leading up towards the Sabbath. So if we wanted to talk about what the Sabbath meant for the Jews, their week would be working for the weekend, no doubt. We are working towards the Sabbath. We are moving towards that day. What does the Sabbath mean? Well, we, it starts uh, two key scriptures. We get the creation story, which is in Genesis chapter 2, which is where I want to start. For six days, God has created. He's put a different piece of uh, the world into existence. Day six, he breathes uh, humanity into being. And at chapter two, we get this in Genesis. It says, so the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. And on the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. And so he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and he declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all of his work of creation. And this is the account of creation of the heavens and the earth. Now there's a few things that we need to know about this text. First of all, when it says that God rested, uh, it does not mean that he stopped, that he took a break. Uh, the, the little translation is God ceased, God ceased creating. 
He had created all that was needed in this world. All that he had planned on created, he had created it. He had made it. It was sufficient. It was good. It worked. And now he ceased creating. He didn't get exhausted. He didn't get tired. He wasn't worn out. He wasn't stressed because of the work week. He gets to this place, and now he says, now I am ceasing this creation. And we know later in the story of the Garden of Eden, then he walks with Adam and Eve in the garden. He ceases creation, and now he enjoys creation. This is also in all six days, he creates it, and he steps back and he says, this is good. On day six, he says, after he creates humanity, he says, this is very good. Good thing. Did well. On day seven, he ceases, and he doesn't call it good. He says, now this day is holy. This day is set apart. This day is different than all the other days. They're good. This day is holy. It is set apart. It is special. We get a little bit, we, we talk about uh, the Sabbath as being important because it, it forces us to remember to rest. We often talk about the importance of being able to rest. Um, and when we talk about rest, we talk about uh, there are two kinds of kind of vacationers uh, in the world. Some people go on vacation and they fill their schedule up uh, with every possible activity and event that they can do while they're on vacation. The other uh, vision and the idea of vacationers are the people that go and get away and don't want to be near the crowds and don't want to have a full schedule. They just kind of do things as they feel inclined to do. That is the type of vacationer I am. Uh, I want to get away. I want to not look at a schedule. I don't want to think about planning things. I just kind of want to go through my day, and as I have a, a thought or an interest or uh, something I want to do, then I, get to, then I want to go and pursue that. Uh, of course, with three kids, uh, you don't really get to do that. So when you vacation with kids, it's called going on a trip. Um, God says this Sabbath day is holy, and it is a day of resting, but it's resting with the purpose of this holiness for which he had created it for. It is ceasing to stop doing the tasks that we fill our week with. And it's time for you then now to spend time with your creation, with your existence. The idea is that if, if you were to do this uh, within your family, then you would stop with everything else and your time would be focused and concentrated with your family. As I studied a little bit about the Sabbath and the Jewish history, um, the key, a few key things about the Sabbath is it, it starts with the woman's work. The woman starts the Sabbath by lighting the candle. It's her job. And I think that's important for us because I know as I watch Cammie around my house, it is easy for her to fill her time with uh, doing the laundry and, and cleaning up after the kids and just busy, 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 busy. And, and I'm like, Cammie, just, just come and, and sit down and take a break. And I just want to get this done. I want to get this done. I want to get this done. I'm like, it didn't go anywhere. You know, you could, you could chill out for an hour and two hours, and it's still going to be there waiting for you. And, I, and there are guys that are like this. I, I get in, uh, in seasons where I'm like this. But I think it's, it's important that we understand that this starts with the women lighting the candle because I think it's key for us to be able to intentionally step back and say, now I am ceasing. I'm ceasing the work. I'm ceasing the, the constant to-do list of things that are there before me. I cease and I will now be with my family. The other key thing, not only does it start with a woman, then the next thing uh, that I saw over and over and over again is within the family, uh, on the Sabbath, love making is, is very much upheld on the Sabbath. Yes! Thank you, God! Go Jews! Uh, husbands, feel free to use that, but uh, Patrick said, we're going to honor the Sabbath, honey. Meet you upstairs in five minutes. Um, no, what a, what a great way to remember we have created. God has created. He's given us this life. We have this gift before us. We have this gift of a family and relationship. And now we're ceasing so that we can enjoy this, this family, this bond, this union. 
Uh, and so two, two key things about Scripture. We have another thing where, where Sabbath then takes another turn later on in Scripture. Uh, if you want to flip over to the second book in the Bible, we're going to go into Exodus. And we're going to talk a little bit about where Sabbath gets new meaning. Uh, the story of Sabbath, this idea of Sabbath is there from the get-go. From the beginning of creation, we have this idea of the Sabbath. It's there before the law is established. Okay, when we talk about the law, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. And if we were to look at the Ten Commandments, uh, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. All those, we, we kind of look at those and we're like, okay, we, we got those. I do those all the time. But if we were to look at this fourth commandment, do uh, to honor the Sabbath. In fact, if you go to uh, Exodus 20, it's the longest, the longest description of the commandments. It's in verse 8. It says this. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest, ceasing, dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one is your, in your household may do any work. This includes your sons, your daughters, your male and your female servants or slaves, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, but on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and sets it apart as holy. It's the longest description. Most of us would, could step back and say, yes, I follow the Ten Commandments. And if I were to push you and say, well, do you honor the Sabbath? Some of us would say, well, yeah, I go to church on Sundays. Okay, that is, understand, that is not the Sabbath. Saturday is on Saturday for the Jewish faith. Now, uh, it got changed to, su to Sunday when the faith became the uh, organized religion during Constantine's reign. Um, but Sunday is not the Sabbath. Sunday is the day, uh, uh, Little Easter. Think of that. It's the day where we gather as the community and remember what Christ did, that he rose from the grave, that he abolished our sins, that he freed us from, from being oppressed by the guilt and the judgment that is there. That is what Sunday is. Sunday is a celebration. Sunday is a time for the, the, the community to come together and to share in the feast and to remember this table and remember the forgiveness of our sins and remember what Jesus did. Sabbath is a holy day set apart for ceasing everything else of the week. The Sabbath is holy. So where does this come into play? Well, it comes into play when the Israelites are in Egypt. They are trapped. They're working under the Pharaoh's guard. And uh, Moses goes to the Pharaoh, and he says this a few times. He says this in 7, chapter 7 and chapter 9. I'm going to pick it up in chapter 9, where he comes in. The a few of the plagues have already been uh, pronounced upon on Egypt uh, for them not letting them go. And Moses comes before the Pharaoh again with this command that God has given them. This is verse, uh, halfway through verse 13 where it starts. It says, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Go to the Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go so that they can worship me. And if you don't, I will send more plagues on you and your officials and your people. Now, I want to go back to that statement. Uh, let my people go so that they can worship me. This is how the New Living Translation says. Uh, in some of the older translations, it says, let my people go so that they can serve me. In chapter 7, he says, let them go so that they can worship me in the wilderness, so they can serve me in the wilderness. And the idea is that they would go out to the wilderness, they would offer their sacrifices to their God, not the Egyptian gods. Now, the Hebrew word also means, when you take worship and take it back, it means serve, but it also means slave. So God is commanding the Pharaoh to let my people go so that they can go away from this land and be enslaved to me. No longer will my people be ruled by your standards, by your expectations, by your workload, by the things that you have put them under and forced them to do. My people will be released, and they will have the freedom to be uh, to have their thoughts and their hearts and their energy and their faith solely directed at me so that they work for me, so that they worship me, so that all that they do is dedicated and committed to me. Now, when we think about the Sabbath, we often think about it as kind of a punishment, that it's this holy time out, that God says, now stop doing work, and we're like, oh, man, I can't work, I can't do anything. That just stinks. That is not what it is. This is a gift. God is giving us the Sabbath 
as a gift. It's what Jesus says in the New Testament, that the Son of God is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, Son of God, we don't know. Uh, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God and the Son of Man when he refers to himself. And the Son of God was not necessarily a messianic title. It didn't mean that he was the Son of God um, in birthright. It was a term that was used for those who were most faithful through the Jewish faith. And so as Jesus, when he says the Son of God is the Lord of the Sabbath, is he saying that those who are most faithful to God will be able to master this holy day and treat it the way that it is meant to be treated? Well, those who are most faithful to God will not be perplexed by the Sabbath and be held to the Pharisaical laws that are in the Scripture and are there to be governed and as boundaries. It's not that those who are faithful to God will know how to cease their work and to appreciate the things that they have created and have been given by God. That they'll be able to to turn off their cell phone, that they'll be able to shut the laptop, that they'll be able to spend time with their family and enjoy it. That they'll realize that they are a gift in front of them, given by God. That their time won't be filled with tedious tasks that are exhausting and frustrating, but that their time will be spent with building the relationship, tending and nurturing the relationships that are there in their household, that are there among friends. It's a holy day. It's a special day. It's a day that we are uh, invited to God to begin to look forward to the day that is coming when we will, as Jesus said in this, I will not drink of this vine again until I am reunited with you. I am not, he says, I am not going to do this until you and I have the full Sabbath. Until the full new creation is in place. And then we'll celebrate. And so all the meal preparation was done beforehand. All the work was done. We prepare, we prepare the first day towards the Sabbath. We take six days making sure that by the time that we get to the Sabbath day that we are ready to enjoy it. That we're ready to, to, re, to relax in it and to spend that time with those uh, who we have established to spend that time with. If we take uh, this story uh, of the Exodus and we take the story of creation and we look at what is being shown here as we continue on through the scriptures, uh, one way to understand it is this. If we understand the geographical movement that's happening, the people have entered into Egypt. They've been put into slavery and to oppression. And now... At this time, God is calling them out of Egypt, and they will go to the mountain, out of the desert, out of the Pharaoh's land, and into the mountain where the holy God reigns and creates the people of Israel. In Egypt, a royal construction enslaved them. Their boys were killed uh, so that they couldn't raise up and have power and overthrow the Egyptian. And God pulls them out of Egypt. He claims the firstborn of Egypt, humans and animals alike. He draws them to Mount Sinai, where the firstborn males of Israel, humans and animals alike, are claimed by God. They are mine. I own them, God says. And at Sinai, they are upheld. And a new beginning starts. No longer will you be controlled by man's desires and man's governments and man's precepts. Now you have the law. Now you will be governed by the things that I want you to know, the things that I have inaugurated for you. You will be given a promised land, something to look forward to, something to hope for, something that will be provided. And as they move from Egypt through the desert and they move towards this promised land, it needs to be understood that the people are brought up to the mountain. They're brought to Mount Sinai, and they are afraid of God. And so God says, send them back down the mountain, and I want your leaders to come up. And so this progression begins where the people of God were governed by a pharaoh and by a system that was outside of God. And God says, I'm now going to draw you out, and I bring you out from underneath that canopy from man's rule. And now I am, he invites them. He says, you come up to Mount Sinai, and the people are afraid. They're afraid to come to God. And he says, okay, give me your leaders. And so he establishes leaders in place where he says, now you will be, uh, you will, I will speak through these leaders, which I have established, who will follow the precepts and the laws 
and the, the relationship that I have for you. So he establishes Moses and the judges, and eventually he'll establish the king. And the goal of the pr- pilgrimage here, as they move out of Egypt and into the desert and towards the promised land, God is establishing it so that Jesus can come, and no longer do we have to go through the leaders of the religious uh, ordinance that we are in, but now we can be bound directly to God. That we can have that relationship one-on-one with him through Christ's uh, life, through his sacrifice. That there is no mediator to go on between us. Paul talks about this in Romans 8, where he says, uh, You are no longer slaves, but you are children. If you go back to the text where Moses speaks to the Pharaoh and he says, let my people go out to the wilderness so that they can serve me, so they can be my slaves. God takes that next step in the relationship where he says, no longer are you my slaves, no longer are you my servants, but now you are my children. You are my flesh and blood because I've given you Jesus Christ. Now you're part of the family. You are belong. And so no longer is Sabbath now this day that we set aside and we we go to church or we we practice the laws or we practice the rules. Now Sabbath in Christ becomes this thing where we get to celebrate life. One of the Jewish laws in the Torah was that uh, you couldn't do any work on the Sabbath and Jesus is caught going through the fields and his disciples and he are picking grains off of the plants, and that would have been seen as work because they're harvesting, they're doing a sense of harvest. And, and the pharaohs come against him and say, your disciples, they don't even observe the Sabbath. And this is where Jesus says, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. He says, no, 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 we, we do honor it. This is a good thing. The hardest thing about Sabbath is keeping legalism at bay. And it's hard. I, I, I thought about this week over and over again, and I just naturally fall back into this rhythm of, of legalism. I can't do this because it, it would not be honoring the Sabbath. And I get so caught up on what's the right way to do it and what's the wrong way to do it that you get to the end of the day and you're like, well, I just wasted the entire day because I was too busy thinking about what's right or wrong and not enjoying the moments that I had. And Jesus says the, the Sabbath is about celebrating life. And these people are hungry, and they're celebrating life. And you're trying to take that from them. And it's funny because the Pharisees, they go off then, and they plot to kill Jesus. So wait a sec, we can't work on the Sabbath, but it's okay to plot a murder on the Sabbath? Mm. See, Jesus knew their intentions. He knew how hard it was for us to really enjoy being in the presence and the Spirit of God that we put everything else aside and we focus on the things that God has given to us. The idea was to be that we step away from commerce, that we turn off, uh, that we turn off all communications, that we just stay uh, at home and we enjoy the family and the friends that have gathered there to spend that time together. I, I'd encourage you that as you think about the Sabbath, that you would think about how it is that you can celebrate the life that God has given you celebrate the lives of those that he's put in and around you. It may be on Saturday. It may not. Uh, I try to form my Sabbath on Friday uh, for myself. Um, and for my family, it, it becomes something else uh, from time to time. Um, but what is that day for you? What is that time for your family to gather together and to be uh, one as you join together? What does it look like? Dorothy C. Bass said this of the Sabbath. She said, Sabbath keeping is not about taking a day off, but about being recalled to our knowledge of and gratitude for God's activity in creating the world, giving liberty to captives and overcoming the power of death. Would you please stand and join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, as we think of these disciplines, we think of the Sabbath. Father, may we set these things to heart that we would go back and look at what the heart of the Sabbath is. Father, that you would help us to bind a legalism in our life. That we wouldn't worry about how others are observing it, but God, we'd only be interested in letting ourselves be free from the places where we allow ourselves to be enslaved. 
God, may you free us so that we can go into the wilderness, so that we can go into the world, so that we can go throughout our week realizing that our work and our, our satisfaction and our joy and our pleasures, they don't come from those things out there that the world has to offer, but they come through the things that you have given us. God, help us to not just be content and satisfied with keeping a workaholic mindset, of, of being proud of the fact that we can stay constantly busy. God, help us to make those decisions so that we can be available. So that we can, in the world's eyes, waste lavish amounts of time with just being with you and our family that we don't have to have an agenda, that we don't have to have things planned out, that we spend our weeks preparing for the weekend, getting everything else done in order that we can sit and rest and cease in your spirit. For God, you've called the Israelites to a promised land and you call us to a promised life. But God will only be able to enjoy that life if we spend that time experiencing it here once every seven days. Allowing our life to sink into a rhythm where we are preparing to experience the holiness and the goodness that you provide. Father, bind us to these ways. Bind us to the tradition. Bind us to the heart of your word. Bind us to the spirit of God and one another as we share in the celebration of life and the feasting of the gifts that you've given us here. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God offers this invitation. He says that you are the sanctuary. Your lives are to be the living sacrifices that he gives us. And uh, as we continue to think about that, and we continue to think about what it is that God has done, us, uh, done for us, I'd invite you to write those down, to give God thanks for what he has done. Uh, and maybe, maybe you don't know. Maybe it's hard to come up with the things that you should be thankful for. And maybe you need to start with that place of confession where you say, God, I, I know I should be thankful for this. I know I should appreciate this. I know you have given me this, but God, I just don't have the spirit of thankfulness. Maybe that's where it needs to start, where you recognize the things that you know that you should be thankful for, that you know that God has given you, that you know that without his grace and mercy upon your life, you wouldn't have it. And you offer that to God. You say, here it is. I, I know I should be thankful for this, but I'm not. Help me break my spirit, break my stubbornness, break my pride, break uh, this enslavement that I have so that I can get to that place and that spirit of thankfulness in my life. May you go in peace. May the spirit of the Sabbath enter into your hearts and your minds so that you be can begin to wrestle with that spirit and begin to find that place of ceasing so that you can love the things that God has given you. In his name we pray.